Hello, welcome back to our lecture series for Western Civilization 101. We are now discussing the uh, ancient Roman world. And so our topics are concerning uh, previously, of course, the influences for Rome. You learned about the Etruscans, for example, a few lectures ago and how the Romans definitely uh, pulled in a lot of Etruscan influences like their dress and their architecture, just to name a few. Um, you've also learned, of course, about the Roman monarchy. And, you know, the Etruscans had kings as well. And the Etruscans actually were kings over the Romans there for a while. And no matter how it, you know, there was a legend, of course, I had mentioned in the previous lecture about how the Romans overthrew the monarchy. Either way, they did. They revolted against the Etruscan monarchy. And we have what is established, it's called the Early Republic. It's around um, 509 BC. So the kings will be replaced by two elected officials called consuls. Um, we also have new offices that are being created here in this early republic. We have uh, censors who were chosen every five years to make an assessment of the population on the basis of age and property, you know, for purposes of taxes, military service, and office holding. Of course, we have a census today, you know, uh, of course, these censors were the officials that monitored that here in the uh, early republic. We also uh, have officials here in this early republic who will possess what's called imperium. Imperium means the right to command, and there are certain office holders that had this right. You'll learn, of course, more about um, the politics of the early republic in just a few minutes. You know, we still have um, the, the Council of Elders that you learned about when we were discussing uh, Greek history. And we still have an assembly here in the early Republic in Rome. Um, so you'll learn more about that as well. But th that basic structure seems to be the same. Now remember, the Greeks were living in southern Italy at this time. And the Greeks were definitely also influencing the Romans as well, um, as well as the Etruscans who came from the north, the Greeks who lived in the south, the southern part on the island of Sicily, will also influence the Romans um, in their society and their politics. Now, we have, of course, um, with Roman society, we have what's called the patricians the aristocracy, and they will dominate politics in this early republic period. They consisted of families who were descended from the original senators, the senate being the council of elders, uh, during, uh, maybe appointed during the time of the kings. They were usually, of course, wealthy landowners. And they had religious privileges, and only the patricians could, could serve in the highest offices in the early republic or be senators. Now, you also had another group of people called the plebeians. Um, they were the small farmers, and, and they weren't very happy uh, with their lot in life. They were the less wealthy landlord, uh, landholders, maybe craftsmen, merchants, small farmers, uh, they did not have the same rights as the patricians. And there was, uh, they couldn't marry. There was no intermarriage between the patricians and the plebeians. So we'll have a struggle um, that will ensue between the patricians and the plebeians called the struggle of the orders. And the patricians will actually uh, come out pretty, uh, the plebeians I should say, will actually come out pretty well in this because they get the right to intermarry with the patricians, but we'll see that the people that, the plebeians who will start serving in government and start more of the, you know, marrying the patricians are the more wealthy segment of society. They get a new office um, from this struggle. They get the office called the tribunes. This office was supposed to protect the plebeians from the arbitrary power of the patricians. But like I said, the poorer plebeians could not serve in government. They, they couldn't afford to. 
So, you know, we'll see that the richer plebeians and the patricians, the aristocracy, will have more in common. They have um, than they will with the poor segment of society. Now, as far as religion is concerned during, you know, this early republic period, it, it resembled Greek religion. Again, the Greeks also very influential with the Romans. Um, not, not exactly like the Greek religion you learned about. Romans didn't view their gods as uh, so much as meddling in, in the affairs of humans and being jealous. Uh, the Romans were more practical when it came to their religion. Uh, they felt that you should follow a certain ritual or certain order um, to get favorable results from the gods. And again, we're not, we're not um, worshiping the gods here, the Romans, in order to gain salvation or anything like that. It was more for material um, and current uh, things that are happening is what they would um, worship the gods for. There was a lot of very formal public religious um, acts performed, of course, during the early republic, and uh, still superstition among the Romans. The Romans would also look for signs uh, that everything was good. For example, they would look at the flights of birds or, or lightning or the behavior of certain animals and uh, they had people responsible for actually interpreting those signs. Uh, and if you compare the Greek gods to the Roman gods, you'll see that, for example, Zeus was the, the father you know, of the gods with the Greeks, and then his counterpart in Rome would be Jupiter. Um, you also see this with uh, like the wife of Zeus. Her name was Hera in, in Greek mythology. In the Roman religion, the counterpart to the Greek Hera would be Juno. Uh, she was the wife of Jupiter, and so on and so on. Ares was the god of war in uh, Greek mythology. Mars is the god of war according to Roman religion. Um, so you can definitely see similarities between the two. Um, as far as the religion is concerned here in this early republic. And, of course, continuing on throughout our other lectures uh, that we'll have. So let's find out more details about this early republic in Roman history. Last time we looked at the social processes and government at Rome, and we saw that the Roman Republic began as a pure aristocracy. But by about 270 BC, it had evolved into at least a partial democracy. Another part of the story from the early Republic on is Roman expansion. So today, we'll begin with some questions. And by the end of the hour, I hope, hopefully, uh, that we will have answered some of them. So, how did Rome expand? Why did Roman expand? What motivated Romans to devote so much time and energy to war? In their early history, the Romans were almost continuously at war with the other states around them. Conditions in Italy and in the early Republic made it almost impossible for Rome or any other state in central Italy, for that matter, to avoid war. There were literally hundreds of small, independent states in Italy, and all of them were competing for, with each other for power and resources, for land and food. Uh, most of these states needed land, and the only way they could get it was by taking it from each other. Uh, the the uh, Romans, the Italians were not seafarers. They couldn't plant colonies the way that the Greeks had. So the only, the only alternative was to make war with their neighbors. Because war was so common, the Romans came to admire and to reward 
uh, men who were good soldiers and good generals. If a consul won a great battle, he and his relatives would find it easier to win election in high office, would find it easier to acquire more land and more loot from battle. Uh, even common soldiers earned great prestige when they fought in an important Roman victory. They were also given land and a share of the spoils of war. Thus, the Romans were always ready and even somewhat eager to fight if they were given any reason to do so by another state. And conditions were such that a reason could usually be found. Another important reason for Roman expansion is also related to the frequency of warfare in the early period of Rome's development. Romans became used to regarding their neighbor as a potential enemy, as a potential threat. Romans began to see the word next door neighbor as synonymous with enemy. As Rome expanded, expanded in Italy, she kept bumping into other quarrelsome neighbors that wanted her land. Hence, the unwritten assumption of Roman foreign policy became every new neighbor is yet another potential threat. Uh, the Romans tried to take care to ensure that their love of war would not lead them to fight other states without some just cause, without a reason, a, a justifiable reason for warfare. They believed that the gods controlled all of human affairs and that the gods would not aid them if they fought for an unjust cause. In fact, to ensure that the gods would always approve of their wars, the Romans created a body of religious rules, religious laws, that defined the conditions under which Rome could fight, under which Rome could declare war, and uh, under which conditions under which treaties could be made. There was a board of 20 priests who were called the Fetiales, 20 priests called the Fetiales, who were entrusted with interpreting these rules. When the threat of war arose, the priests would investigate the causes and decide whether or not Rome was justified in fighting that particular war. The recommendation of the priests wasn't binding, but it was unusual for the Senate or the assembly of the Roman people to ignore the advice of the Fetiales and make war against their advice. Rome's success in war largely depended on her army. So I, I want to look briefly at what the Roman military system was like. Down to about 100 BC, the Roman army was a citizen army made up of average Romans. Uh, almost all Roman men from the age of 17 to 46 could be drafted into the army to serve for a period of time. The only men who were exempted from service were those very, very few Romans, at least in the early Republic, uh, who did not own any land, who didn't own any farmland. Uh, poor men couldn't afford to buy their own armor and weapons, so poor men couldn't afford to fight. Uh, you had to buy your own kit, rather the way that the Greeks did. So in order to fight, in order to be in the Roman army, you had to be able to afford to buy your own equipment. Uh, in the early Republic, very, very few Romans didn't own at least some land. Most of them were farmers, if we've, as we have seen. So most male Roman citizens were eligible for service. Now, as in Greece, 
The Romans fought mainly in the summer months when there wasn't any farm work to be done. Soldiers would be drafted in the spring, they would fight through the summer, and then they would be discharged to go back home uh, during the winter and care for their crops. Uh, this was possible as long as the Romans were fighting around the city of Rome, as long as they were fighting in Italy. But of course, in later times, this became much harder uh, because uh, they would have to leave Italy in order to fight, and, and it would be much harder to get home, to go somewhere like Greece or Spain or North Africa for the summer and then return home to their farms. Um, so the Roman army was an amateur army, just like those of all the Greek city-states with the exception of Sparta. Because there were farmers, these soldiers were very tough, and because they didn't have much, they were very determined. And even as amateurs, they would have lots of experience because a Roman could be required to serve a total of 20 summers in the army between the age of 17 and 45. So they would, they, they would have, to, have to fight for 20 years or be in the army for 20 years during their period of eligibility. One factor that helps to explain the success of the Roman army was that it usually had very good leadership. Uh, and in, in fact, this is rather surprising. Uh, at first, the armies were commanded by the consuls, who were themselves amateurs. Uh, they held command for only one year. They, they didn't spend a career in the army. They held command for only one year. Uh, because their experience as generals was limited, Rome produced, in the early period at least, very few great generals. But most of them were relatively competent. And we should consider why. Members of prominent Roman families all expected to be consuls someday. And so in order to prepare in advance for the military duties that a consul would have to undertake, during their youth, usually at the age of 16 or 17, uh, young men would accompany relatives or close family friends when they went to war. Uh, when they had a command, the young men would accompany them on a sort of military apprenticeship. And during this apprenticeship, they would be trained in um, tactics and strategy. They would be trained also, because they would have to serve as junior officers, they would be trained in the field. They would get schooled on the battlefield, as it were. Uh, in addition, they got experience commanding members of the lower ranks of the army. Now, Rome's earliest conquests can be neatly divided into three parts. The conquest of central Italy, the conquest of northern Italy, and finally the conquest of southern Italy. From 500 to 400, the Romans fought primarily to protect themselves uh, from the peoples who lived around them in the plains of central Italy. This was primarily the Etruscans, uh, but other, other Latin peoples as well. Those who uh, lived in the Apennine Mountains around the city of Rome would come into contact and ultimately go to war with the Romans during this same period. They were usually barbaric peoples. They had very loose tribal organization of some kind. Because of the constant warfare, states would band together for the common defense it was natural for Rome to ally with other Latin cities around her because they had a lot in common. And indeed, in 493 BC, 
all of the Latin cities, including Rome, formed a military alliance called the Latin League, 493 BC. It was aimed primarily at two groups of enemies, as I said, the Etruscans that lived north of the Tiber and the tribes in the mountains around Latium. At first, Rome was simply an equal partner with the other Latin states, uh, but gradually the size and skill and toughness of the Roman armies uh, made her the, 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 uh, the leader of the alliance. As warfare continued, the Romans conquered the various hill tribes and city-states that were in competition in central Italy. To make sure that they would not be threatened by the same folks over again, Rome settled some of her own citizens among these conquered people. Roman citizens would receive land, settle down, and form communities of their own, and often intermarry with the local folks. What this means is that Roman settlements were now further away from Rome, from the city itself, and they would have to be protected as well, which of course means further expansion. Now, the Romans did something for their conquered enemies that would never have occurred to the Greeks. The Romans extended citizenship to those Latin peoples and other conquered neighbors who would benefit from citizenship. Not, not all conquered peoples could benefit from full Roman citizenship. After all, Rome was a republic, with, uh, like the Greek states, and only people who lived within a fairly short distance, say a day's journey from Rome, uh, could take part in the political life of the city. Those who lived close to Rome became Roman citizens, and those who lived too far away from the city to take direct part in Roman politics were extended Roman rights that they could use. For instance, the right to do business in Rome, uh, or the right to marry a Roman citizen and become a full Roman citizen themselves. As a result of, oh, they were allowed, however, their own local government, these people that were given Roman rights. As a result of the extension of Roman citizenship and Roman rights, Rome grew very, very quickly, gaining a population and an army much greater in size than any Greek polis could ever hope to acquire. Now, in the 390s, another threat appeared, this time from the north. Tribes of Celtic peoples, called the Gauls, began to raid central Italy. The Romans organized resistance among the Italians, Italian cities, and they ultimately and fairly quickly defeated the Celtic threat. In 282 BC, the Romans received an appeal from some of the old Greek cities in southern Italy to assist them in resisting one of the lesser Hellenistic kingdoms in western Greece. Uh, the Romans agreed to provide assistance. This kingdom, by the, by the way, was called Epirus, and the king was named Pyrrhus. The Romans agreed to provide assistance. They fought against Pyrrhus uh, from 282 to 275, when they finally not only defeated the king, but essentially brought all of southern Italy under their influence. So by 275 BC, the Romans controlled all of Italy. So again, the first stage of Roman expansion is comprised of the Roman conquest of Italy. It extends from the founding of the Republic in 509 BC down to 272 BC. Roman expansion in Italy mainly consisted 
of adding more and more states to the Latin alliance until Rome uh, finally owned all of Italy or controlled all of Italy. These conquered states became her allies and gained Roman rights and in some cases Roman citizenship. Many states in Italy even became allies voluntarily because Rome could protect them when they were being threatened by someone else. You should recall that Greek empires, like that of Athens, also organized alliances. But the Roman alliance was very different from those in the Greek world. It was much more stable. Unlike Athens and other Greek city-states uh, city that attempted to expand and form empires and alliances, the Romans treated their allies very well. They didn't interfere with the government of allied city-states. They protected their interests in war. The Romans sometimes needed help from her allies, especially in her early history. She was careful not to offend her allies, something the Greeks would never have thought of. She was careful not to offend her allies because the Romans were afraid that the gods would disapprove if Rome didn't keep her treaty obligations. Rome also gave the peoples of many allied states Roman citizenship. This again was something that Athens and the other Greeks would never have thought of. It wouldn't have occurred to them. In Athens, all citizens were supposed to have an equal chance to take part in government, an equal chance to hold office. Uh, but this and this was only possible if the number of citizens in the Athenian city-state were rather small. But in Rome, only a small number of families tended to monopolize the major offices in the state anyway. They could give out citizenship without seriously threatening their power within the Roman state. Citizenship was valuable to the Allies, not so much for political reasons, but for commercial reasons. They could trade with the Romans on an equal basis, and they could intermarry with Roman families. All Rome required of her Italian allies in return was that they support her in war and provide troops to fight in the Roman army. Generally, it was a good bargain for both sides. The Allies got protection and fair treatment, and the Romans got a vast army to assist them in their conquests. Now, once Italy had been consolidated, once the Romans had consolidated their dominance over Italy, the next two stages of Roman expansion would be much shorter. The second stage was the Roman triumph over the western Mediterranean. This stage was the hardest of all, for in it the Romans faced their most truly formidable enemy, and that enemy was the city of Carthage. Carthage was one of those cities that had been built on the north coast of Africa as a trading post originally by the Phoenicians. They're the Canaanites from the eastern Mediterranean. As a Phoenician city, Carthage was very active in trade activities and commerce. By 264, Carthage had established a lucrative commercial empire that included much of North Africa, west of Egypt, uh, part of Spain and the islands of Corsica and Sardinia. The Romans would fight two long and very costly wars with Carthage. The cause of the First Punic War, as these wars are called, the First Punic War, Punis is the Latin word for Carthage, the cause of the First Punic War, which lasted from 264 to 241, 
was Carthaginian expansion into Sicily. If you look at a map of Italy, you see that Italy looks a lot like a leg in the process of kicking a ball, and that ball at the bottom of Italy is the island of Sicily. Now, the eastern side of Sicily had been settled long before this by uh, Greeks. There were three or four important Greek city-states on the Italian side of Sicily, the eastern side. The western side had a population that was made up of the peoples that had lived in Sicily before the Greeks arrived, the, the older uh, Sicilian population. And the Carthaginians began to use their trade, their commerce, and their influence initially with the Western peoples, the Sicilians, if you will. And increasingly, the Carthaginians became uh, to dominate more and more of Western Sicily, and this scared the heck out of the Greeks. So the Greeks went to the Roman Senate. Members, agents from the Greek city-states went to the Roman Senate, and they complained to the Senate that Carthage was causing problems in Sicily. At first, the Roman Senate said, well, you know, so what? Not our problem. But the, the Greeks were able to convince the Romans that once Carthage had taken Sicily, then the obvious next step in the advance, advance of the Carthaginian Empire would be Italy. Once the senators became convinced that Carthage might become a future threat to Rome, they went into action. Representatives from the Senate went to Carthage and told the Carthaginians to stay out of Sicily. Carthage refused, and so Rome declared war on Carthage. In this first war, most of the fighting took place on the sea around the island of Sicily. And, and this was a real problem for the Romans. They were placed at a real disadvantage because the Romans were not seafarers. They weren't sailors. Heck, they didn't even have a navy. Uh, they created, they were forced to create a large fleet when they found out that it was necessary in order to fight this war. They borrowed ship designs and probably labor builders as well from their Greek allies. They built ships and got their Greek allies to row those ships. Then they modified these ships so that they could turn sea battles into land battles. After all, they were good at that. Using this new navy and with bearing up to tremendous losses, the Romans finally won the First Punic War through sheer perseverance in 241 BC, 241 BC. The chief, well, once they had defeated Carthage, they forced Carthage to pay an enormous fine to give up uh, Sicily, uh, I'm sorry, to give up their, their plans to expand into Sicily and leave the Romans in peace. The chief feature of the Second Punic War, which goes from 218 B.C. to 201 B.C., was that the Carthaginian army was commanded by another one of those military geniuses that pop up from time to time, a fellow by the name of Hannibal. Now, Hannibal was the governor of the Spanish colony, or in, of the Carthaginian Spanish colony, and became angry at Roman meddling with a couple of independent city-states in Spain. Now, Roman historians tell the story that Hannibal had always hated the Romans because the Romans had defeated his father in the First Punic War, and his father had made young Hannibal swear an oath that when he grew up, he would destroy the Roman state. He would destroy the Romans. It's a, it's a great story. Whether or not it's true, we don't know, but good story nevertheless.
At any rate, Hannibal decided to take the war to the Romans. Hannibal led his forces into Italy in 218 BC and proceeded to beat the Romans in battle after battle. But Hannibal could never accomplish two feats that were essential in order for him to defeat Rome. He could never take the city itself and he could never get the other Italian cities to abandon their Roman allies. Those policies we talked about, giving lots of rights and independence to the Italian cities, really paid off for Rome during the Second Punic War. The Romans had very little success in defeating Hannibal until 204 BC, when the Roman army was placed under the command of a fellow by the name of Publius Cornelius Scipio. Now, Scipio decided to use a different method to defeat Hannibal. He landed a massive army in Africa to threaten Carthage itself. In order to defend his city-state, in order to, to defend Carthage, Hannibal was forced to leave Italy, return home, and at the Battle of Zama, near Carthage, the Romans defeated Hannibal for the first time and also defeated the Carthaginians. Hannibal himself fled to the Hellenistic kingdoms in the east, and Carthage surrendered. Rome was now the chief power in the central Mediterranean. Oh, and by the way, Scipio received a new name. He became Publius Cornelius Scipio Africanus. Africanus means the conqueror of Africa. After Zama, the Battle of Zama, the king of Macedonia, Philip V, welcomed Hannibal to his court. Hannibal assured Philip that the Romans had expended so many men and so many resources defeating Carthage that Philip could now sort of play loose and, loose and fast in Greece itself, could acquire some Greek territory. On Hannibal's advice, Philip began to put pressure on the Greeks uh, who complained to Rome. The Romans put Scipio back in charge. Scipio raised an army and fought a war with Macedon called the Second Macedonian War, which lasted from 200 to 196 BC. He crushed Philip. Uh, the Punic Wars, in fact, had not weakened Rome, but made Rome only stronger, giving it a larger, more experienced fighting force and more able commanders. After defeating Philip, the Roman Senate made the Macedonians pay a large fine and told King Philip to leave Rome's friends in Greece alone. That done, Scipio and his army returned to Rome. But Hannibal escaped, and he ran away to the Seleucid kingdom, another one of these Hellenistic kingdoms. Once there, Hannibal convinced the Seleucid king, a fellow by the name of Antiochus III, that, hey, the Antigonids are weak, and the Romans must be tuckered out by now, so why not take us a, a shot at expanding your influence, O King Antiochus, into Greece? Antiochus fell for it. In 192 BC, he began to move into Greece. The Romans asked Scipio to go to work again. And as you can guess, he defeated Antiochus in something called the Syrian War lasted 192 to 189 BC. The Seleucids were fined. They were told to behave and leave Rome's friends alone, and the Romans 
returned home. Oh, by the way, at this point, with nowhere else to run, Hannibal did something useful and committed suicide. So between 204 and 188 BC, Rome became the big power in the whole Mediterranean basin. I should mention that the Romans didn't annex any of these defeated states, not yet. They just charged them enormous fines and told them to behave. But the extent of Roman expansion up to now outside of Italy, the fullest extent of Roman expansion up to now, up to 188 BC, outside of Italy, had been the acquisition of Spain from Carthage, and that's about it. Uh, Rome was not the great empire that she would become, but Rome had changed as a result of all of these wars and all of this exposure to other civilizations in the Mediterranean, and not necessarily for the better. So what I want to do with the rest of this period is discuss the consequences of Roman expansion and Roman warfare in the Mediterranean in this early period. Remember that the early Romans had a simple agricultural economy. Most Romans were small farmers who only grew enough food to provide for their own needs. As a result of Roman conquests, this system would be replaced by a much more advanced economy. The Roman conquest made it possible for Rome and Italy to develop extensive trade in the Mediterranean. Roman contact with the Greek civilizations of the East created a demand for luxury goods that Romans had never tried before. Romans paid for these goods with money that they had brought home as a result of conquest. Also by 200 BC, it was becoming harder and harder for small farmers in Italy, especially in Rome, to make a living. Now there are a number of reasons for this, but the most important grew out of Roman warfare. In the early period, as I said a little while ago, uh, most Roman soldiers were small farmers who farmed in the winter and fought in the summer. Uh, this was easy since the wars took place close to home, but when the Romans began fighting far away in, say, Spain or Greece or Africa or Asia, many soldiers were forced to stay away from their homes for longer and longer periods of time. The longer the manpower was deprived from the farm, the harder it was for these folks, for the family that was left at home, to tend to the farm. And so gradually, uh, Romans began to lose their farms. Poorer, more common Romans began to lose their farms. And of course, when they lost these farms, uh, they would move to the city. Wealthy Romans would buy the farms up, combine these farms together in large estates called latifundia. Unlike early Roman farms, the latifundia were mainly intended to produce cash crops like cattle or olives or grapes for wine. Uh, and the labor on these farms would be slave labor. Latifundia were operated by slaves. The owner himself might only visit once or twice a year. He looked on it as an investment, uh, not really as a place to live. The slaves who worked these estates were non-Romans who had been taken prisoners of war. 
in Rome's overseas uh, uh, wars. These changes caused very serious disruptions to Roman society. Those farmers who were forced to sell their land moved to the city uh, and the urban population of Rome, the urban population of Rome rose very rapidly in Italy after about 200 BC. In the cities, work was scarce since slaves did most of the skilled and even the unskilled labor. There were not enough jobs available, so the unemployed either had to beg or steal to make ends meet. Gang warfare began to grow, as did street crime and other social problems like prostitution. Crime became a serious problem for the first time in the city of Rome. While a growing number of Roman citizens became poorer, a small number of Romans became increasingly wealthier and wealthier. Fairly early on, it became necessary for the Senate to create a welfare program for the, Roman, for the city of Rome. It was called the Corn Dole uh, that provided poor Roman citizens in the city with free grain to keep them from starving, free, free grain to make flour to make bread. The, the winners in this new economy had varied backgrounds. Most senators made good money but there were also others who became rich as well. A new wealthy class rose up in Rome, and it was called the equestrians, which means, of course, the horse riders. These were the folks who were wealthy enough to ride in the Roman cavalry. Uh, these equestrians lived, were merchants and, and uh, uh, bureaucrats for the Roman state. They, the wealthy Romans lived in unprecedented luxury. They had expensive houses and clothes and slaves. They could afford to provide better education for their children. In fact, they began sending them off to Greece to receive their schoolings. In short, the lives of wealthy Romans grew increasingly more and more different, more and more different from the lives of poorer Roman citizens, and the number of poor grew, and the number of wealthy stayed about the same, but these wealthy citizens became richer and richer. These social and economic difficulties were aggravated by political problems. After 200 BC, a few of the best known and best organized families increasingly monopolized the important Roman elective offices. They fell into a class of wealthy Roman senators that came to be known as the nobiles the nobiles, which means essentially the notable or well-known persons. These families came to dominate the Senate. In fact, one historian who studied the Roman Senate in the 50s BC determined that the Senate was dominated by about seven Roman families. And since the, since the Senate became an oligarchy at this point, it means the whole Roman Empire by the 50s BC is literally run by seven Roman families. The Senate, which made the families that dominated the Senate, which made the government less responsive to new social and economic problems. The Senate had no real interest in the problems of the poor. They had no desire to share power with the equestrians uh, who wanted a greater role in government. The nobiles interfered 
in conquered lands outside of Italy. These lands were divided up into districts called provinces, and each province was entrusted into the hands of a Roman general known as a proconsul, and of course the Senate appointed these men to hold these posts. The Senate was supposed to supervise foreign affairs. They were supposed to supervise provincial affairs. As generals, these proconsuls had wide military power, equivalent to the consul at Rome. Proconsuls collected taxes. They administered justice. They led the army. And so they were in a perfect position to extract money and wealth from the local population that they ruled. The Senate was supposed to keep this from happening, but after all, these proconsuls were members of senatorial families, so the Senate was reluctant to really keep too close a watch over them. The Governors were often guilty of very serious abuses, these proconsuls. They collected more taxes than they should, and they skimmed the excess profits into their purses. Togas don't have pockets. They extorted the people of the province. They provoked frontier wars. They built up enormous personal armies. Corruption grew in the empire, as did callousness about foreign expansion, about diplomacy, about the relations of Rome with her neighbors in the Mediterranean, both her provinces and those independent areas that were left. This can... This this process reached a sort of a turning point for me in 146 B.C. In 146 B.C., there are two events that take place that I think are very different from past Roman diplomacy and warfare, and I think this, this, this points to a turning point in Greek history. The first was in Greece. Roman leaders pushed the Greeks until, in desperation, southern Greece revolted from Roman influence. Instead of resorting to diplomacy to settle matters as they had in the past, the uh, Roman consul, a fellow by the name of Lucius Mummius, invaded and destroyed the city of Corinth, he took all of the wealth home to Rome and all of the men, women, and children who were left after the war were returned to Rome and sold into slavery. He had no re real reason to do this. There was no reason for him to attack Corinth. In fact, Corinth wasn't really part of the quarrel. But Corinth had become a trade competitor with Rome. And so what Lucius Mummius did, he did for the Senate. He did to increase Roman power and wealth. That same year, Rome declared war again on Carthage. Without any provocation, any more than that Carthage still existed. The great city of Carthage was defeated, destroyed, so that, quote, not one stone was left standing on another and Roman soldiers sowed the ground around Carthage with salt so that nothing would grow there. Truly, by 146 B.C., Rome was the 800-pound gorilla on the Mediterranean block, and it was out of control. Okay, so 
we, of course, learned a little bit about the early uh, history of Rome. And as we continue forward in our upcoming lectures, we'll continue discussing Rome. In fact, um, you learned a lot about the early Republic period today. Um, when we come back for our next lecture, you'll, uh, we'll discuss the late Republic. Um, it was a time of chaos and actually very famous events occurred during the late Republic. You may um, have heard of Spartacus. They made a lot of movies about him, this big, huge, very famous slave revolt, revolt that existed, um, occurred during the late Republic. So uh, we'll find out more about the Romans until next time.